I dragged myself to KFC to get something to eat before I went to sleep. It had been a long day. I had two projects to submit at school earlier and I was able to finish them just at the nick of time. Now my brain and my body were exhausted. It was a little after 6 o'clock and there was still quite a few people inside KFC. I ordered chicken and chips and started to eat my meal in silence. Three other tables were occupied aside from mine. A couple sat at one and the remaining two had a guy and a woman sitting there. The couple left when I was halfway into my meal and it was just three of us left in the restaurant. Soon enough, the other two people left, leaving just me. I finished the last of my chips and stood up. I noticed there was a wallet on the floor. The man must have dropped it. I shrugged, thinking it was none of my business. I thought of my comfortable bed at home and couldn't wait to get it. With heavy steps, I got to the door and turned the knob. It was locked. I frowned and tried again. It was still locked. I rattled the handle, starting to get scared. Hello? I shouted, hoping the waiter would hear me. Your door is locked! There was no response and I sighed before making my way behind the counter. There was no one there. I walked through the door that said employees only and glanced around furtively. Hello? I said again. I heard a door creak and jumped, my heart beating fast. Is someone there? I whispered, my voice breaking. I saw a movement behind a door and walked carefully towards it. I opened the door slowly and my mouth dropped open in shock. I screamed as I took in the scene before me. There was someone on the table and the person was cut open. There was a lot of blood everywhere. The waiter was standing beside the table where the person was laid on, his gloved hands soaked in blood. I recognized the person on the table as the woman that just left before I did. The waiter lunged for me. I turned on my heels and ran. I figured that screaming wasn't the best option for me, so I kept quiet and ran in the opposite direction of the restaurant area. I had a few seconds head start, so I used that to my advantage. I could hear him behind me. I took a turn to the right that made him lose sight of me for a moment. I opened a door on my left and dashed in, closing it silently. It was a storage room, filled with mops and other cleaning equipment. I covered my mouth with my hand, trying to stifle the sound of my panting. He came down the hallway fast and suddenly stopped. Does he know where I am? There was no way to see him through the door. I trembled when I heard a door opening. I know you're in here, he said opening another door. I looked around for anything I could use as a weapon. It was only a matter of time before he opened this door too. I saw a jug of bleach on the floor and quickly carried it, unscrewing the cap. I grabbed the mop just in case. He opened the door next to mine and I steeled myself. The door handle got turned slowly and my mind went blank. I believed this was the day I was going to die. No one would ever know what had happened to me. As soon as the door opened, I tossed the contents of bleach on him. It got in his eyes and he collapsed on his knees yelling. His eyes were shut tightly and his hands were trying to reach out for me. Bitch! He swore. I whacked his head with the mop and scuttled out of the room. I was very determined not to die. I ran back into the restaurant and tried to open the door again. God! I was sobbing now. The adrenaline coursing through me before was gone. My hands were shaking and I couldn't stop heaving. I rammed the mop into the door. It didn't even crack. It didn't stop. I'm not going to die! I kept muttering to myself. I haven't lived a life I was happy of. I was the second of three children, the only girl. I chose a university in Detroit because I wanted to be away from my overbearing parents. It wasn't like I had achieved anything. At the age of 21, my academics were nothing to write home about. That was why I wanted to kill myself on the last projects I submitted. Having good grades in them would help boost my CGPA. I stopped banging the mop on the door. There was a crack. 
I sobbed in relief and raised my hands to keep banging it. I paused. There was a man outside, his wide eyes staring into mine. Before I could cry for help, something collided into me from behind. The waiter covered my mouth. He slapped my face and kept yelling into my face. Everything was going well until you appeared! He yelled and slapped me again. I stopped screaming. My jaw was in so much pain. Please! I said through my tears. He responded by yanking my hair and slamming my head to the floor. My struggles became weaker and I found it difficult to raise my hands. I didn't want to die, but it seemed I was failing at that too. Before my eyes closed, I heard the sound of glass breaking. What the hell? said a stranger's voice. That was the last thing I heard before my eyes rolled back in my head and my world went dark. I didn't die, but I was in a lot of pain. My jaw hurt terribly and my face was swollen. I was told I had been unconscious for two days. Someone came to visit me and I recognized him as the man from KFC that left before me. His name was Steve. He said that he came back for his wallet when he noticed that he dropped it. That was when he saw me trying to shatter the glass. He called the police, but they were taking such a long time that he decided to come inside. He found a way to break the glass and managed to stop the waiter from killing me. He is a psycho. Apparently, he got kicked out of some doctor's school, but still wanted to prove himself. He had been practicing on the people that came into KFC whenever he was on the night shift. I swallowed and thanked him. My name is Julia, and I'm deeply grateful. Steve smiled at me and told me to be careful before he left. I swore to myself that from that moment, I would start living my life the way I wanted to. The snow was as beautiful as ever. It looked white as usual. Safe to say, it was pure in its own sense. The winter period would always be my favorite. The family comes around and everyone gets to enjoy one another. My family was the type that cherished family time a lot, and growing up in that kind of environment, I was naturally the kind of person who lived to create moments that we would cherish forever, and things that would remind us of the future. This time, my family had games day and night planned. There were many games to play with, and my family decided that every game that was ever created in physical form would not go untouched, and so we had to sort out all of the games to different days. The first day started normally. My brother came back from work complaining that he was so tired, but, but I couldn't relate as I was only almost a university graduate. I didn't even know what to do to work to earn a living, but as the saying goes, tomorrow would sort itself. And that was the rule that was pushing me forward, even if it felt really hard. The first game we started with was Monopoly. The rule was very simple. Just try to get as rich as you could be. Dad was business-minded, and we all thought he was going to win, but things took an interesting turn, and the fact that I was writing this with my whole family in the hospital just says the summary of all that happened. Things started quite well, with everyone in a good mood, and even my mom, who was rarely ever smiling, had a wide smile plastered on her face that day. At first, my dad had the winning hand, which made us all annoyed at the fact that knowing how to handle money was just his thing, but after an hour, Things took a drastic turn and Caleb, my brother, became the richest. It didn't seem like a problem to any of us, but if only the inner part of human beings could be read, we would have known that we were walking into the lion's den with the lion around, but with the face of a cute bunny. Almost suddenly, Dad threw his chair in the air, and when I looked up, he was furious and his eyes were red like he really needed someone he could tear apart anytime soon. Dad, Caleb said, and I called the same name, Dad. Oh, you people think you can just take all of this from me and just make me poor like I have no sense or what? My dad said. Mom, I thought these episodes were over. That's what the doctor said, isn't it? My brother said. What were they talking about? My dad used to have episodes that made him flare up? I looked at mom and she just had her head pressed down and when she looked up, tears were at the brim of her eyes. And that was more than enough confirmation for me that what my brother said was right. My dad used to be an angry person? He used to have episodes? There were so many questions. How come I didn't know about it for almost 25 years? How long ago did they do treatment? And why was he back to how he used to be? My dad rushed to the kitchen and when he came back, he had a very sharp knife with him. One of the new ones that mom recently bought. 
He pointed it at my mother and smiled at her, a smile that was creepy and which I could not define. Then he looked away from my mom and looked over at my brother. That made me scared, coupled with the fact that I could not tell what he was thinking or why he was moving towards my brother with determination in his eyes. A horrible and creepy determination, and the knife that was with him was pointed towards my brother, just a few inches away from him. My brother didn't try to move or run from the fact that a crazy father was pointing at a knife at him and that he could do anything crazy. Before I could finish processing my thoughts, my brother fell to the ground and blood spilled from his stomach. His skin suddenly went pale. I looked at my dad to see if I was going to find at least one hint of remorse in his eyes, but it was not there. Instead, he walked towards my mom with the same horrible and creepy determination, and before I knew it, my mom's body dropped to the floor too. They were both breathing, but who knew for how long? I looked up at my father again, and this time, he looked confused, and just when he looked at me, I saw tears in his eyes, but I was not moved by that. What happened here? Did I lose it again? Princess, please, please tell me I didn't do this, please, he said, dropping the knife that was with him, and looked around again to confirm that he really was seeing his family members on the floor. The question is, what did happen here? I can see that you are really crazy, and you have no idea and you have no iota of respect for your family members to the point that you stab them all in the name of anger issues. Even if your head was not in the right place, didn't your eyes see their faces before you stabbed them? Hmm? I replied him. His eyes moved back to how they were before, red and anger written all over it. He walked towards me this time, and I was hoping that he was not going to do whatever he had on his mind. My head moved and ran from him, but my legs could not run. I was glued to a spot. A part of me had this hope that he was my father and that he couldn't do it, but a part of me told me to run as fast as I could away from him. I trusted him instead and I just stood there, hoping that the look on his face would change soon. Instead, when he got to me, he pointed the knife at my belly and he looked me dead in the eyes. I closed my eyes and said my last prayers, but when I opened them, I saw his own body on the floor instead, with his blood around him. He stabbed himself. Without thinking, I yelled, enough to make the neighbors run in, and when they did, I couldn't tell what happened after that, because when the first person ran in, I took the same knife my dad used and stabbed myself. Everything went black, and I said my last prayers. Sheila, stop! I protested as my sister dragged me to the bathroom. She shushed me and told me if I didn't want violence, I should comply with her. I sighed in frustration. Sheila was my twin sister, and we were alike in everything other than our personalities. Sheila was bold and daring. She was never shy or scared to speak what was on her mind. I, on the other hand, was more cautious and conservative than she was. Sheila was studying fashion while I was studying psychology. It didn't matter that we had different majors because we were in the same university. Our friends sometimes confused us for each other. I stayed silent as Sheila curled my hair to look like hers. Her plan was the infamous twin snitch. The last time we did it was in third grade. Now I would live a day in her life and she would live in mine too. She straightened her hair already and when she was done with me, she sighed in contentment saying that I looked gorgeous. I couldn't even argue with her if I wanted to. I was the type to take anything she threw at me. My calm attitude betrayed me in situations like when I need to talk. Besides, it couldn't be that bad. The last one we did in third grade almost put us in trouble. Put me in trouble. But we got around it, and we could probably do the same this time too. When she was done with styling me and dressing me in rather short clothes that felt very uncomfortable and almost resulted in a fight, I just gave in and left the room for classes. The twin switch also meant that I had to attend her classes for the day, and she had to attend mine which was probably going to be the hardest part because her friends were always unnecessarily proud and loud, while my friends were just bookworms that Sheila was definitely going to have a hard time getting familiar with as well. As I stepped out of the hostel, I noticed someone in a black hoodie and glasses who stood by the entrance. It was weird to see a guy in the girls' hostel that early, but it was none of my business. He could be here to see his sister, or to collect something from someone. I kept walking to class which was also a weird behavior for Sheila. She was not an early bird, and going to class early was not her thing, but I was also not the type to stay in the room till late in the morning. Everyone knew Amelia as a good student, and even if I was going to be Sheila for a day, I wanted to keep my good records the way it was. 
Sheila didn't tell me the reason for the twin switch, but I just took it as one of the days she wanted to have fun and I had no choice but to follow the idea. Sheila ended up doing crazy things and dragging me to it every single time. I couldn't count the number of times I took the blame for her. I noticed that the guy I saw earlier was behind me, but this time he was on his phone. He was probably a student of fashion class as well, and I didn't recognize him because I didn't know Sheila's classmates so well. Thinking about it again, was he waiting for me when I saw him earlier? It would have been weird for him not to say anything to him when he saw me. Whatever, it wasn't my business. I sat down quietly in class, and the mysterious guy sat beside me. I was right, he was also a student of the class. He dropped his bag on the chair. Hi, he said. I raised my head to see his face turn to me. Hi, I replied before facing my books that were on the table. Psychology and fashion class? The guy asked, which made me realize that I forgot to pick up Sheila's textbooks and give her mine. Yeah, just a fan of psychology. I had to give him a reply. Just like I'm a fan of your page on OnlyFans, he said. Quite confused at what he was talking about, I asked, I don't understand what you're talking about. What page? What's OnlyFans? I love the pretense. I knew you were not going to admit it, and I know it's been a while since you posted pictures. Have you changed? I know about girls like you. Fake bitches. I promise to make your life a living hell and mess you up, he said, and my mouth opened in shock. Before I had the chance to ask for any explanation, he took his bag and he left, leaving me confused. I pushed it to the back of my mind, hoping to ask Sheila about it, since it was her class, she could understand it better. The classes went by quickly, and as much as I tried to forget the incident with the guy earlier, I couldn't. It kept playing in my mind over and over again. I was almost out of the class when a hand pulled me by the neck of my shirt. I straightened my posture, and I looked back to see the same guy from earlier still dressed in his black outfit with his glasses. He grabbed my arm and tightened his grip on it. I yelped, and then he laughed before releasing me. After a long day, I walked into the room to see Sheila in tears and curled up on her bed. When she noticed my presence, she straightened up herself and cleaned her eyes, but not before I could notice it. Amelia, you're back. How was today? Had fun being me? She put up her usual bold, confident self, but I could easily see through it. I asked her why she was crying, and she dissolved into tears. She told me that she had opened an OnlyFans account due to the pressure from her friends and because of the money. She got comfortable with posting nudes of herself and other content while being paid through her fans. When she explained the whole thing, I understood it. The same guy who threatened me today had been threatening her for a while now. I got furious and marched out of the room. I knew his room and I would make him pay. As I walked to the boy's dorm, I saw him walking out and quickly hid myself before following him. I knew what I had to do. If anyone was hurting my sister, I'd take care of it by making sure they no longer breathed. Honeymoon. That was one word that always brought out the joy in me. I don't know why, but it always did. And coupled with the fact that this time it was my own honeymoon, my joy was even contagious. I was happy and everyone was happy for me. After about six months of dating, I eventually got married to my Prince Charming, Jacob. He was everything and more. I just had to be happy for myself. The following day was amazing. Jacob was naturally an emotional person, and when I walked down the aisle with my dad, he just smiled in tears as he looked at me with utmost wonder. Who knew that just being in a wedding gown could make a grown man cry more so in front of many people? He didn't try to hide the fact that he adored and cherished me, and at that moment, I just knew that he was the one I would keep falling in love with over and over again. The program went by really fast, or I just didn't focus on all what the priest said. I was far too interested in something else, the face of the one that was about to be called my husband. And then it came. You may now kiss the bride. Jacob walked towards me with love, and I just stood here ready to receive him with love. It was at that moment that I understood what he meant when he said the kiss on your wedding day just feels different. 
With stories that I've heard from girls, I was too excited to plan my honeymoon when Jacob told me that it would be a surprise, and that I shouldn't bother planning anything as he already had everything under control. Eventually, it was here. The surprise he had planned, and I couldn't wait for it. He drove us to the airport, and when I asked where we were going, he merely smiled at me and told me to relax. We ended up traveling to Los Angeles. I was ecstatic. It was everything I wanted and more. We rented a car, and I sat beside him, smiling. Where are we headed? Jacob laughed without mirth. <laughs> You'll find out, dear. I looked at him again. It wasn't like him to joke around with anything he said, and it was not like him to also use the word dear. He hated it with so much passion. Either way, I sat quietly in the car and just assumed it was part of the surprise he had planned for me, even if that meant that a part of me was scared about whatever was going to happen. A few minutes later, or so I thought, I slept off at some point during the drive and only woke up when I felt the car already come to a stop. When I opened my eyes, Jacob was no longer at the driver's side or anywhere near the car. In front of me was a very big mansion. I got down from the car and walked towards the house while taking every step carefully. The house was really beautiful. I'd give that to whoever came up with blueprints of the house. Mrs. Thompson. I turned back at the voice that called me, and in front of me was a man probably in his thirties. If not for the fact that I didn't know who he was, I would have hugged him so much for calling me that name. It felt good to be a part of someone now, to be a part of Jacob. The man told me he was our butler and would be taking care of us. I wrapped my arms around my middle and searched for Jacob. As if I summoned him, he came out of the house and walked straight towards me. My smile froze at the cold look on his face. I asked him if anything was wrong, and he said no. He went ahead to tell me that this was my new home. I didn't know what to make of it. We never discussed moving here. As much as I love the house, I loved my life back at home. I told Jacob that he had to be joking because there was no way we could live here. His face turned red with anger, and he marched up to me and slapped my face. My hand touched my face in shock. Jacob just slapped me. You're my wife, he spat. You do exactly as I say. I own you now. Jacob? He slapped me again. Tears slipped down my face, and I wordlessly followed him inside. I got married to a monster. He took me to one of the rooms and locked me inside. He told me he'll be back for me. I was dreading when he would come back. I sat on the bed crying. There was no way to contact anyone. My phone was still in the car. How didn't I see this before? I was carried away by his handsome face and blue eyes that I failed to notice that Jacob was a psychopath. Jacob came back after a while and forced himself on me. No matter how much I pleaded with him, he didn't listen. He left me sobbing on the bed, a wicked smile on his lips. When the butler brought in my dinner, I kept the knife, a plan forming in my mind. I wasn't going to be anyone's plaything. Jacob had picked the wrong person to mess with. The door to my room opened, and I sat up in bed with some trepidation. Jacob came inside with another man and barely glanced my way. I stood up from the bed and tried to put as much distance between us as possible. Jacob and the other man started kissing, and my jaw dropped open. I couldn't tear my eyes away as they began to undress each other. When they were both in their boxer shorts, Jacob looked at me and laughed. Want to join in our fun? He asks before grabbing me and planting his lips on mine. I suddenly brought my knee up, and he doubled over in pain. I immediately pointed the knife to his face, and he backed away. I ran out without looking back. I heard the sound of a door opening and the butler's voice. My breaths came in frightened gasps. I saw the keys to the rental car on the table and dove for it. The car started as the butler came running out. I drove the car through the gate and I was free. Now that I escaped, I let the tears run free. How was I supposed to trust anyone after this? This was one honeymoon I would like to forget. I always thought that my girlfriend was a 10, and to be honest, I have pretty low self-esteem. 
I'm not nearly as close to her level of attractiveness as I'd like to be. To get a pretty clear picture of me, let me describe myself in a few words. I am shorter than my girlfriend. I have no visible abs. My arms are skinny. I still have pimples on my face even though I am 28 years old. My job, well, is not one I can be particularly proud of. Even though it pays the bills, I work as a receptionist at some hotel at the edge of town. Now, let's move on to my girlfriend. She's tall, has beautiful green eyes, dark hair, full lips, and whenever we go out, people would just stare at her and sometimes other guys would even walk up to her and ask her for her number. Even though I am right there next to Michelle. That's her name. She would always say that I am the one for her and she loves me. But lately, I don't know. Something feels off. I see her on her phone most of the time, smiling or even laughing. And if I ask what's so funny, she would just smile at me and say that she's talking to her friends. But I didn't think that to be true. I thought she was cheating on me and it would be just a matter of time until she would break up with me and go for another guy who was in her league. One night, while she was asleep, I heard her phone buzz. I didn't want to be the type of guy to snoop around and to not trust her, but something told me to see who messaged her. I got out of bed, slowly walked to her nightstand, and just as I was going to pick up her phone, I heard, mm. She woke up. What are you doing, babe? She asked me while stretching her arms over her head. Um, nothing. I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't want her to think that I was going through her phone. I saw her empty glass next to her phone and I knew what to say. I wanted to go get some water and I saw that your glass is empty so I'll refill it for you. You know how you feel thirsty throughout the night. I told her while grabbing the glass. Thank you, she said in a very sleepy voice. I went downstairs but all I could think of was the fact that she might be cheating on me. After I drank some water, I went on to my computer. I wanted to look up some sort of device so I can track her. I didn't know what I was looking for, so I just typed in girlfriend cheating spy. Those keywords took me nowhere. I changed the search term, but still nothing. Only a bunch of small cameras and stuff. Then the only thing I could do was to use the dark web. I haven't been there for ages, I said to myself while thinking about it. It was like I was going on a quest or something. Where is it? I searched for the right browser, I set everything up. And there I was, on the dark web, looking up spy devices like an absolute psycho. No, hmm, no. I said quietly so my girlfriend wouldn't wake up. Suddenly, something popped up that caught my eyes. It was very different from all the other devices I managed to stumble across. It was something along the lines of a small camera which can be attached to someone's eye. It could record stuff and even pick up sound. I was more intrigued than anything. I placed an order seeing it was only $20 with free shipping. Seeing that I can't find anything serious except the joke of a camera, I closed my laptop and went back to bed. The next day, I woke up a little bit late. Shit, 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 I say while looking for my clothes. What's wrong? Michelle asked. I'm late to work and I can't find my pants. I reply while frantically looking around the room. Fast forward, later in the day and I arrived home. Michelle was out with some friends, or at least that's what she wrote on a note pinned to the dresser. I threw my bag on the floor and got into the kitchen to get some water. I saw that the glass was already full and I drank it. All of a sudden, I felt my knees were weak and before I knew it, I blacked out. I woke up about three hours later on the couch, but I remember so clearly that I was just in the kitchen. I got up and said, Michelle? Michelle, are you home? but I didn't get a response. I grabbed my phone and saw a text message. Order delivered, it said, and the message ended with a link. I didn't want to click on it, thinking it was something spammy, so I just ignored it so I can call Michelle. Hey baby, did you get home? She said. Yeah, where are you? I asked her. Just out with the girls having a couple of drinks, she said. I got nervous. I didn't want to sound controlling, but I didn't trust her friends. They always seemed like they enjoy getting around, if you know what I mean. Okay, babe, I'll be waiting for you. Stay safe, I told her. Sure thing. I won't be long. Love you, she replied. I wanted to go to the bathroom, but something seemed wrong. It was like I had something in my eye, and it tickled a little bit. 
I started rubbing and rubbing. At that moment, I got another message. Don't do that. You'll hurt your eye. I was baffled. Who could have sent that? It didn't say from which number it came from, just like the delivery one. I looked around, looked outside, but there was no one there, just me. I decided to click on the link and it sent me to a video. It was my living room. What the hell? I said. I moved around the house while looking at my phone and I noticed that the video was live. It was broadcasting from inside my house. And worst of all, when I blinked, the screen would go black. This can't be happening, I said while wanting to text the person who did this to me. But I couldn't send anything because I didn't have a number. Instead, I got a new text. Don't bother trying to contact me. You can't. All you can do is speak and I'll hear it. Maybe I'll respond and maybe I won't, the text said. Why did you do this? Do you think it's funny? What did you do to my eye? I asked, speaking by myself in the house. Are you this dense? Why do you think the camera was so cheap? With such impressive technology, I own you now. Everything you see, I see. So if you don't want me to ruin your life and steal every password and every cent you have, be sure that you're gonna pay. Oh, and don't even think about closing one eye when you enter a password or a card pin. You'll slip up eventually. And I have all the time in the world, the next text said. I couldn't believe it. I was being blackmailed and I couldn't do anything about it. All because I was sure that my girlfriend was cheating on me. I sat there on my couch and thought to myself, what can I do to get out of this mess? But I didn't speak. I didn't want the guy to hear me. In the meantime, my girlfriend came home. After those drinks, she was feeling kind of frisky, but I couldn't let the guy see what I saw. I'm tired, baby, not tonight, I told her. She got upset and went upstairs. Wouldn't mind seeing that, the next text said. After that day, my life kind of fell apart. I couldn't be with my girlfriend. I couldn't do anything because I was thinking that that guy could see it. I couldn't focus on other things. I couldn't pay attention at work. I nearly got fired because of that camera. The guy kept bombarding me with all kinds of messages, commenting on everything I did. I started to become depressed. I couldn't take it anymore. One evening, I had a little bit to drink, and I don't know why, because of the alcohol or the depression, I went outside, drove drunk to a nearby bridge and hopped up on the ledge. I didn't want to live anymore. I couldn't live like this. When we last left off, I was ready to end my life. In case you don't remember what happened, let me refresh your memory. So as the insecure man that I was, I went online to search for devices that would permit me to spy on my presumably cheating girlfriend. I stumbled upon a camera, and the next thing I knew, someone attached it to my left eye. From that moment on, that person was capable of tracking my every move, seeing everything I saw, and basically ruined my life. Now let's get back to what happened. As I was about to end my life, something made me reconsider. I was about to jump when my phone started buzzing. Someone was calling me at that exact moment. I had a feeling that the guy who ruined my life was calling because he saw that I was about to end my life. But boy, was I wrong. It was a different number, so I picked it up. Hey, my name's Jason. I'm so glad you're still alive. I'm sorry, do we know each other? I asked the guy who called. Oh, no. Tell me something. Do you have a camera implanted in one of your eyes? Y yeah, I do. How did you- Just answer with something vague from now on. I don't want the guy to hear our conversation. It seems that his tech only captures the sounds that the person makes, but not the ones he hears on phone speakers or headphones. And just so you know, I'm using a text-to-speech app, so he doesn't pick up this conversation from my camera's microphone. I'm going through the same thing. I got your number by being able to hack a database of every person who bought that stupid camera. Okay. You're not the first person I tried to contact. Just today, I called over 20 people. But it turned out that they all committed suicide. You're the only one that picked up the phone. Go on. The man explained that he had an idea about how to find out who did this to us. But, he needed the help of another. He wanted me to reveal my credit card information so that the guy would see it. Then, when he'll use the credentials, a tracker would be set, and then we'll find out his exact location. 
I didn't quite understand everything he explained, but I got the general idea of it all. Tonight, I said, so I won't reveal any details. A wide smile appeared on my face, something that hasn't happened in ages. I immediately went home. My girlfriend was waiting for me. She was on the couch. I could see the pain I caused her for some time now. I went to her, gave her a hug, and told her that everything will be okay. She didn't even look at me. It was like we became total strangers. And I know that my behavior caused that. I didn't want to lose her. I went into the bedroom and pulled out my credit card. I then made it look like I was adding the details to a website so that I would make a purchase. The plan went on as expected. I quickly received a text from the one who implanted the camera. I knew you'd slip up sooner or later. Don't bother calling the bank to cancel the card. In a few seconds, all of your funds will be transferred to me. It was a pleasure doing business with you, he said. How can you do that? Please don't, I replied. But I knew I had him. Well, I thought I did. I never heard from Jason and got really nervous. What if I lost all my money for nothing? What if Jason was the same guy? Or was working for him and he tricked me? All of these thoughts started popping up. But sure enough, after about 10 minutes, I got a call. Got him. I see you're just half an hour away from me, so I'll come and pick you up. Be sure to close one eye when you came out and, on the way, there. I'll have a night patch over the camera and I suggest you fashion something similar so that he won't figure out where you'd be. Also, no talking. I'll bring an iPad and we'll communicate with each other by typing. The guy told me. It seemed that he had it all figured out. I couldn't wait to make this nightmare disappear. I went downstairs, and as I wanted to tell my girlfriend that I was going out, I saw that she was out. In no time, I heard a car horn. Jason was in front of my house. I ripped an old t-shirt and tied it so that my implanted eye would stay closed. I went outside and got into his car. He didn't seem anything like I imagined him to be. I thought he was just another scrawny, desperate guy like myself, but it turned out that he was massive. He had big, bulging muscles and tattoos. He looked really dangerous. And in the back seat, he had two guns. He wrote on the iPad that one gun is for me. I got so nervous that my legs started shaking. After about a two and a half hour drive, we arrived at the guy's house. Here we are. Come on, let's go in through the back, he wrote. I complied and followed his lead. The house looked like nothing special. Jason picked the lock and opened the door without any issues. Looked like it wasn't the first time he'd done it. The lights were off, and it seemed that no one was there. Either way, we searched downstairs, and then it was time to go up to the first floor. As we slowly walked up the stairs, one of them creaked. The next thing we knew, a voice came from the bedroom. Who's there? Then, the voice echoed from some sort of speaker that was in the same room. Oh no, the voice continued before we heard a window open. He's on to us, let's go, Jason said as he rushed up the stairs. We arrived in the bedroom and sure enough, someone was climbing out the window. Jason lunged at the hanging leg and managed to grab it, pulling the guy inside. To our surprise, it was just a kid. Please, please, I'm sorry, he yelled as he covered his face with his hands. Jason grabbed him by the collar and pinned him against the wall. The teenager still had pimples on his face, and snot started coming out of his nose as he was crying out of fear of the sight of Jason. You'll take these stuff out of our eyes right now, Jason yelled. The teenager explained that he didn't do it. There was a doctor that made the implant possible, and he was on the kid's payroll. It seemed that he made a lot of money out of blackmailing people. The next thing we did was to drive to the doctor's house, who was the kid's second cousin or something. Our implants were taken out that night, and to be honest, it didn't hurt at all. Before leaving, Jason took pictures of the doctor and the kid. He also made copies of their documents. If you pull this stunt again, I know who you are, where you live, and where your loved ones live. Don't test me, Jason told them. He even scared me. That night, I arrived home, happy that I can resume my life. But when I got inside, my girlfriend still wasn't home. I called her, and someone answered. Hey bro, she's busy, a man's voice said. Where's Michelle? Who's this? I asked. I heard her laughing in the background before the guy put her on the phone. 
Oh, you remember that I exist, huh? She said. Michelle was clearly drunk. Then she proceeded to tell me that she was at a party and that everything was over between us. I tried to explain what happened, but she hung up the phone. As I got upstairs, I saw that all of her clothes were gone. And I also saw a note. I'm sick of feeling like I don't matter to you. I'm sick of you not looking at me and not talking to me. It's over. I'll be moving in with Anna until I find a place of my own. Have a nice life, Michelle. One of the first jobs I had was at KFC. When it comes to the experience working there and the staff, everything was amazing. But something happened to me shortly after I got hired. Something so terrible that it made me quit my job and stay away from that place forever. But let us start from the beginning. I was a young, hopeful teen. I just finished high school and instead of thinking about parties and having fun, I had a different agenda. I wanted to have my own money. I wanted to be independent. My parents always supported me, but I felt I was old enough to do something for myself. As I was searching for a job, I saw an ad in the newspaper. It seemed that a KFC opened in the next town and they were in need of staff. It was just a 20 minute drive, so I wouldn't mind commuting. Surely enough, I gave them a call. The ad said they do not require experience, so I knew I was a shoe in The manager was the one who picked up the phone. He seemed really nice and answered any questions I had. Do you think you can come swing by tomorrow at 9am for a formal interview? David, the manager, asked me. I said it will not be a problem and the next morning there I was. Of course, I was sweating bullets, but his calm demeanor made me feel comfortable. After a few minutes of standard questions, I heard the magic words. When can you start? Um, right away, I replied with a wide smile on my face. Finally, I was about to earn my own money and I would grasp the independence I dreamed about. David laughed. I like your enthusiasm. How about you start tomorrow? He said while shaking my hand. I was all set and done. I was a KFC employee. A professional career started about 22 hours after the interview. I showed up the next day ready to give it my all. Everything went amazing for the first two days. I did my job, people were coming in all the time, and we had a pretty cool atmosphere among ourselves. Of course, that would not last. It was the third day. Hey David, what is going on outside? I asked him, hearing some ruckus in front of the store as I was cooking the chicken in the back. Some protesters, they're trying to boycott us. They said our restaurant was built on top of a burial ground dedicated to the first settlers that arrived in this area when there wasn't anything here but trees and wildlife. The two of us went to the front of the store to see exactly what people were saying. There were about 20 angry citizens with signs that said, ban the corporations. Of course, that didn't sit well with me. I asked David if anything illegal had been done so that the store could be built, but he told me that all of the memorials had been moved to the other side of town so everything was in order. We went back to work, but ever since that day, things started to change. It was like all our energy was slowly but surely being sucked out of us. You may call it fatigue, but that wasn't the case. Each night, as I was driving home, I felt like I was about to pass out at the wheel. I didn't think it was something serious. I started drinking coffee even though I never had it before. It still didn't help. After about two weeks in, one evening, David and I stayed late. He had some work to do in his office and I volunteered to clean up the kitchen. At around 1 a.m., I heard something in the dining area. I knew that the door was closed and I personally put a sign on the door. I put down the brush that I had in my right hand and went to see what was going on. The sound I heard resembled a chair falling on the floor, but as I got there, everything was in order. Then I went into David's office. Hey, were you in the dining area just now? Um, no, I'm pretty swamped here, David responded 
without taking his eyes off of some files he was reviewing. I returned to my station and continued to scrub. Another sound caught my attention. I was sure that David was playing a prank on me. I returned to the dining area and again, nothing was out of order. I went into his office and asked him again. And as I did that, another sound came from the same area. But this time, David was in front of me. So it couldn't be him. Did you hear that? Yeah, it seemed like something fell on the floor, he said while getting up from his chair. He thought that maybe some of the protesters broke into the KFC. But when we got into the dining area, nothing. All of a sudden, the lights went off. Both of us looked around. And then the lights went on again. And then off. And then on. This continued for about two minutes. It was pretty spooky, I'm not gonna lie. David went to check out the fuse box. I remained in the middle of the dining area. Ah! I heard. It was David. Something happened to him. I rushed over there in the back of the store. He was sitting in a corner on the floor in the fetal position. What happened? Are you okay? I asked. But he wasn't looking at me. He was looking over my shoulder. I turned around and as I did, I saw a face. It was a man looking right at me from the shadows. Who are you? I asked while taking a step back. He didn't respond. Instead. He opened his mouth very wide. His skin stretched more than it was humanly possible. A loud shriek came out, forcing me to cover my ears. The sound was so disturbing that I fell to my knees. The man then came out of the shadows and slowly glided toward me. I looked down at his feet, but they weren't there. His body ended at the knees. My eyes were fixed on his. My heart started beating out of my chest and I felt a freezing gust of wind going through me. It was a ghost. I was sure of it. The shrieking didn't stop. The ghost got close to me and in a blink of an eye, he flew right through my chest. And after that, everything went black. I woke up a few minutes later. The lights were on. I looked behind me and saw David in the same position. He refused to get up. I called an ambulance and they took him to the hospital. David recovered after several sessions with a therapist. I resigned the next day, but still kept in touch with other employees. I was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida area, but for college, I went to Auburn in Alabama. It was a pretty great place to go to school and I still got a whole lot of love for Bama, but once I graduated, I went right back home to Jacksonville to start my career. But that meant that every year or so I'd fly back to Auburn to hook up with my old college buddies for some heavy reminiscing and some equally heavy drinking. So this is back in 2007, but I flew out of there to spend a weekend with the old frat boys and while we're out drinking, one of them pulls out a pack of cigarettes. I hadn't smoked for years by that point as my ex-girlfriend had hated it, but since she was my ex by that time, I thought... Why not? What harm can it do? So we head out, bum a smoke, then feel that sweet, sweet nicotine reintroducing itself to my central nervous system, all the while we get all nostalgic about our college days. Then, as we're standing there, some car just goes zooming past the bar, totally ignoring a red light before driving up this gentle, curving hill. All we could do was watch in horror as it veered over the double yellow before absolutely smashing into a car coming in the other direction. The impact sounded like a bomb went off, and both cars' butt ends were thrown into the air before they landed with a smash. Then, the engine block of the oncoming car just starts smoking, before we started seeing flames flicking up through the gaps in the hood. And that's when the adrenaline kicked in. With me and my buddy just bolting back into the bar, grabbing a fire extinguisher and screaming at the bartender to call 911. So, there's me, my college buddy, and a few others of the bar's customers running over to the accident. I try spraying the fire in the engine block, but I don't think it was the right kind of extinguisher for a fuel fire because I just about emptied that thing all over it and it barely made a dent. In the end, 
The heat and fumes were so intense that we all just had to back off. I mean, people were gasping for air after taking a lung full of smoke, and besides, the fire was just totally out of control. The thing was, we'd been completely unable to rescue the driver of the oncoming vehicle. The driver off the speeding car was just a mess, and I kind of figured that there was no saving them. No seatbelt. There wasn't. But the woman in the oncoming vehicle was trapped, and as much as we all tried, we couldn't get her free before the flames took hold. We had to listen to that woman burning to death, and let me tell you, it's a million times worse than you can possibly imagine. All those death scenes in movies, they're really just acting. You can't ever get that tone or pitch to a death scream unless a person is actually dying. And I learned that on that night in Bama. The fire department got out to us pretty fast, but it was too late. Then the cops walked some of us back to the bar to take statements. My buddy kept me up to date with the case after I flew back to Florida, and I'm sorry to say, it didn't stop being messed up. So the woman who died was only like a block away from her house, and she was a new mom. While the speeder was some drunk, stupid trust fund kid. Only, remember how I said the kid looked deader than a West Texas salad bar? He actually survived. He lost a leg or an arm, I think, but yeah... He got to carry on living when he had absolutely no right to. This is an experience my wife and I just had this past year. As soon as the quarantine was lifted in our area, she and I filled our packs and went for a hike at our local state park. It was something we used to do pretty regularly and have since before we got married. Speaking for myself, I was really looking forward to it. The plan was to hike out to a certain lake, spend the night, and hike back to the car. It was a clear warm day and the trails were nice and dry. For most of that morning, we had been the only people on the trail. We decided to stop for lunch at a campsite about halfway to the lake. Another couple must have had the same idea. They were sitting at the concrete picnic table and we asked to join them. Soon, the four of us were discussing what we had seen and where we were headed. The couple turned out to be newlyweds on their honeymoon. My wife, who's a hopeless romantic, loved to hear this. She proceeded to tell them how we'd met and some other sappy stuff I don't bother to remember. Two hours passed and we finally said our goodbyes. We arrived at the lake about an hour before dark, tired and hungry. I got a fire started and Mandy, my wife, cooked us a small meal while I pitched the tent. We sat around the fire cooking s'mores and eventually called it a night at around 10 p.m. I got up just before dawn the next morning and got the fire ready to make the breakfast. We repeated our rolls from the night prior except I pulled the tent down and repacked it. All the measures were taken to ensure the fire was completely out after cooking and with that, we took to the trail for the return journey. At 10 a.m. we reached the halfway point but chose not to stop. Two hours up the trail, we ran into the husband of the couple we'd met the day before. Strangely, his wife wasn't with him. Mandy asked him about her location, and the man said that she'd become ill the night before and return home. When he said it, he looked nervous and couldn't look either of us in the eyes. Before either of us could ask anything else, he said that his wife had insisted he finish the trip alone. It sounded a bit strange, but we had no reason not to believe him. A group of people came walking up about that same time and the husband excused himself to talk to them. I wasn't interested in prying any further. Their marriage was none of my business, I thought. Mandy looked like she wanted to stay, but I reminded her of the obligations we had that night. She reluctantly agreed and we went on our way. We got to the parking lot not too long after and packed up our stuff. There were a few groups of people talking amongst themselves. As we pulled out of the lot... Several more cars, including a ranger's truck, were pulling in. Once again, I thought nothing of it. We made it back home that afternoon and handled some family things. It wasn't until breakfast that we heard the news. I had grabbed a cup of coffee and sat down in front of the TV. I flipped it on just in time to receive a report of a dead female camper. When they showed her face on the screen, I almost choked on my coffee. It was a picture of the woman we had met just two days prior. I yelled out to Mandy to join me in the living room. I wanted to be sure of what I was seeing. 
I didn't have my glasses on at the time, and I pointed at the TV and asked, Isn't that one of the newlyweds we met at the park? She watched for a moment and let out a shocked gasp. Just then a wedding photo of the couple appeared on the screen. Mandy grabbed the remote from my hand and turned up the volume. According to the husband, the couple had been at a cliffside that was a popular lookout. Mandy and I had been there once or twice ourselves in the past. They had watched the sun rise and, as they were preparing to turn and leave, the wife lost her footing and fell several hundred feet to the ground below. It was certainly possible, but something bothered me about it. Why hadn't he mentioned this to us? More so, what was up with the illness story? It couldn't have been more than a few hours after the incident had occurred. None of his behavior made any sense. I know if something such as that happened to me, I'd have been a mess. We had passed at least 15 people that morning and not a soul talked to us. It all seemed fishy to me. I was glad to see that Mandy agreed with me. It looked as if though her instincts had been right once again. Just don't tell her I said that. After a long discussion about our responsibilities and the like, we agreed that we should contact the law enforcement involved in the case. And, as it stood, the husband isn't under any suspicion. Not publicly, anyways. I contacted the sheriff's office and told them what we knew. The deputy put us on hold for a moment and when he returned, he said someone may reach out to us in the future. But it's been almost a year and no one has contacted us. And this is what brings me to emailing you here. What do you think? My instincts and my wife's tell us that a crime may have occurred. We, however, have no proof or any real justification for our feelings. And that's just what they are. Feelings. Certainly, if law enforcement believed we had something to offer, they would have already contacted us. Right? I don't want to be a nuisance nor do I want to cause trouble for a grieving man who by all appearances is a decent person. But help me out here. Should I keep pushing or leave the police to do their jobs? I just can't shake this nagging feeling that a man is getting away with cold-blooded murder. Come on, we don't want to be late. I groaned before getting up from my bed. Mom had made me pack my things last night because we were going to meet my dad for a mini vacation. I haven't seen my dad in about two months and I look forward to seeing him. I just didn't think I'd be getting up this early. Rose, don't be lazy. It's just eight. Breakfast is in the kitchen. I strolled down, rubbing sleep from my eyes. I was 18 and the last child of three children. My sisters were happily married and only come home during the holidays. In a matter of time, I'll be out of here. Once college resumed, that would be my ticket to freeing adulthood. I ate my pancakes and shook my head in amusement at my mom as she moved our things to the car. I was the miniature version of my mom. We had the same dirty blonde hair and pale skin. My mom ordered me to get ready and I had to hurry so as to not risk her wrath. It was snowing lightly and it looked perfect for a drive as long as the snow didn't fall any heavier. We hit the road. We wore our coats because the cold was getting intense a little. I picked up my book and lost myself in the world of fantasy that Sarah made knew how to create. Mom was in good spirits and I understood why. She was going to spend time with her husband after a long time. Their marriage was the definition of the perfect marriage. I've not seen any couple stay in love with each other the way my parents were. Even though they were old, they were still in love. They made me believe that love was real because they were perfect examples of what a couple should be. Mom smiled at me, and I shook my head in amusement. She was tapping along to the upbeat tune playing on the radio. We should be with my dad in two hours. The upbeat tune got interrupted by an announcement from the radio. They claimed that there would be heavy snowfall in about four hours, and everyone should stay indoors. We glanced at each other and then shrugged it off. We should be there and safe before then. So we continued, and we just rode in silence. Oh no, what's going on? My mom asked. Cars in front of us were slowing down. There was a blockage on the road and there seemed to be people around the blockage. Suddenly there was a violent scuffle just ahead. The men around the blockage forcefully opened the doors and, and pulled out who was inside. My mom reversed and drove into the forest by the side of the road at a breakneck speed. My heart was in my throat and I was shaking a little. I couldn't believe that our car almost got taken from us. The snow started to fall rapidly and it seemed like the warning we dismissed earlier was coming to pass around us. 
My mom continued to drive through the snow, thankfully that we were safe. The progress we made was little, but at least we were warm. At this point, we could hardly see anything and I was starting to get apprehensive. All the stories I've heard about snowstorms began to flash through my mind. I mean, we just encountered gunmen not long ago. Then, all of a sudden, the car gutted to a stop. My mom was muttering no as she tried to start the car. I sighed loudly. This was the worst thing to have happened to us. Your dad will know what to do. Mom reached over for her phone and cursed when she saw that there was no phone service. This meant we were completely stranded. It looked a bit dangerous for us to remain there and I suggested that we should find someone and seek help. Mom said that we have to sleep in the car till morning before we could get help because of those people we ran away from at first. I was too tired to argue. My mom screamed as my door got opened. I sat there, stunned, unable to make a sound as a pair of hands reached in to grab me. My instincts kicked in and I lunged to the side so that the hands missed me. We hadn't heard him approach. Mom unbuckled her seatbelt and quickly got out. I was still fumbling with mine. The hands reached for me again. So fast I barely moved before one of the hands covered my mouth while the other found the upper part of my arm and yanked. My yell was muffled beneath his palm. Tears slid from my eyes and in those few seconds I wondered if I was going to die. I was pulled out of the car into the cold. My attacker was a large man and I struggled against him as he crushed me into himself. He suddenly lurched forward. Mom was hitting him from behind with a log of wood. She hit him at the back of the head with a loud scream and he groaned as he dropped me. My mom yelled at me to run and I obeyed, glancing back to make sure she was following me. She raised the wood again and he caught it in his hand before it connected with his face. My mom dropped it like it made hot coal and hurried after me. Hearing his heavy, labored breathing behind us spurred us on. We were small and moved through the trees faster than he could, considering the fact that he was just injured. We half hopped, half jogged to the main road. There were still cars passing by, so we knew that we were safe. After limping and walking for about 15 minutes, we saw a motel next to a gas station. Mom had to drop her Rolex watch since all of our money was still in the car. The owner accepted it as a form of payment with a glint in his eyes. Dad had given her that watch on their last wedding anniversary. We slept like the dead that night. When morning came, we called Dad and explained everything that went down. He rushed to pick us up. The police helped us with the car stuck in the woods and we were advised to get loads of rest after that traumatic night. I was still a bit shell-shocked and it felt like I was kind of disconnected from myself. It felt like yesterday's events happened to a different person. Suffice to say, our vacation got cancelled and Dad came home with us instead. It wasn't the vacation that we were hoping for, but at least we were all safe together. I wasn't going to tell this story. It was a traumatic experience for me and for Joey. The dark web is a strange place where some of us might get lost. And not lost in a literal way, but there's a high chance that you'd get involved in activities that will make you forget who you are. Let me take you back to the time when it all started. Me and Joey were at my house. He was supposed to sleep over that night because his parents were out of town. The two of us were like brothers. We'd do everything together, and our parents were good friends. That evening, on the 21st of September, we were all having dinner. Mom, Dad, Angela, my little sister, me, and Joey. My dad had a government job, and he brought up the topic of internet security. No one at the table knew anything about it. Well, no one but Joey. He and my dad started having a serious discussion, using different terms that the rest of us never heard of. Peer-to-peer? Encrypted? What are these guys talking about? I said to myself while putting the last piece of roasted carrot in my mouth. After dinner, we went into my room. Hey man, how did you know so much about what my dad does? I asked him while taking a seat on the bed. Ahaha, <laughs> Joey said while laughing. I've been on the dark web for a couple of months now. It's really cool. Don't tell me you never went there, he asked while sipping on a can of soda he brought into my room. I never did. All I knew were video games were on it. That's pretty much it. I never used my computer for anything else. But that evening, everything was about to change. Joey quickly turned on my computer and started to download a bunch of things I never heard of before. What's this? What's this? I started asking him every step of the way, but he wouldn't explain it to me. He would just say that I needed to be patient until everything's all set up. In no time, he opened a strange browser and said, Ta-da! I was looking at the screen. It didn't seem all that different, but boy, I was wrong. 
Joey started to show me the black market, where all kinds of people would sell different stuff, from guns to organs. I was hooked. It was much more interesting than Google. The next thing he did was to go to a forum. It had all these weird people talking about drugs, the occult, and so on. We stumbled upon a thread about the occult, so I said that we should check it out. There were about 300 comments there, and mainly they were talking about conjuring demons. Me and Joey thought it was pretty cool. And in no time, we actually found out how to do that. It seemed that it's not so difficult. We just needed some ingredients and some sort of incantation. That night, after midnight, we decided to follow those instructions and see what would happen. Of course, neither one of us thought it would work. You ready, Joey? I asked while sitting on the floor with my legs crossed. He was in front of me in the same position. Let's do it. He responded with a wide smile on his face that clearly emanated excitement. Joey said the incantation, and I was doing some sort of sign in the air with my right hand. It all took about a minute or two. That's it? I asked. Yeah, that's all they said there on the forum, Joey responded. Nothing happened, of course, and we were so disappointed. But it's fair to say that we didn't actually believe a demon would appear in my room either. After the so-called summoning, we went downstairs, ate some cereal, and being so late, we went straight to bed. I didn't fall asleep as fast as I normally would. Maybe it was because of the cold milk of the cereal, I had no idea. But I did know one thing, it was getting pretty chilly. I wrapped myself inside the blanket, but my feet and arms were still freezing cold. As I tossed and turned, I could hear Joey. He managed to fall asleep, but he was still speaking. He mumbled some words I couldn't understand because he was keeping me up, I threw a pillow at him. That seemed to make him stop. I eventually fell asleep, but not for long. I woke up, feeling a heavy pressure on my chest. I had trouble breathing. I opened my eyes, and there he was. Joey was on top of me, with one knee on my chest and his hands around my neck. What are you doing? I shouted as I pushed him off. He fell on the floor, and me being in bed, I couldn't see him anymore. Joey? I said as I leaned over the side of the bed. He wasn't there. I looked left and right, but I couldn't spot him. All of a sudden, he jumped on my back and we both fell to the floor. It seemed that he crawled under the bed and came out from the other side. He tried to choke me yet again, putting his hands around my neck. I felt woozy as the blood supply to my brain was getting cut off. I reached to my right and got my hand on a snow globe. I don't know why I had it on the floor next to my bed since it was September. But now I'm lucky I didn't clean my room. I cracked him over the head with it, and that made Joey fall off of me. I got up and turned on the lights. Joey, what the hell are you doing? I asked. I couldn't see him anymore. I walked around the bed, and there he was, on all fours, looking at me like a wild animal. What's wrong with you? Are you okay? But he didn't answer. His eyes were bloodshot, and drool was coming out of his mouth. We both looked at each other. All of a sudden, he focused his attention elsewhere. He looked at the window, and without any warning, he sprinted toward it, still on all fours. I didn't have time to say or do anything. He jumped through the glass, breaking it to pieces. I ran to the window to see if he was all right, but he was gone. For good. My parents came into my room after hearing all the ruckus. I told them what happened, and they called his parents and the police. That night, it was reported that one little girl was almost killed in her own bed. They said that an animal climbed up the window and scratched and bit her before leaving. They said it was an animal, but I think it was someone else. I never saw Joey since that night, but I still have a feeling that sometimes, at night, someone's looking at me through my bedroom window. Open your books to page 41. Everyone in the class turned their textbooks to that page, including me. This was my last year in high school, and I couldn't wait for it to be over. I would get my freedom and finally escape this town. I lived with my mom, and I was sure she would be glad to see me leave. I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I was going to have a career in fashion. I might be a klutz at everything else, but when it comes to fashion, I'm a genius. Everything from color combinations to styling to understanding fabrics, I knew it all. 
Sophia, isn't it? Crap. I had zoned out in the middle of class again. I glanced up at the teacher. He looked unremarkable in his beige sweater and brown pants. He even wore those round-shaped glasses. Yes, sir, I replied. Pay attention, okay? His eyes roved down my body, giving me a weird feeling. I nodded in affirmation and tried my best to pay attention for the remainder of the class. He was teaching us math, and most of what he said passed right over my head. I pretended to write furiously in my notes, whereas I was writing outfit ideas I could advise him on. It continued like that for a couple more weeks. He always found a reason to call my name to make sure I was paying attention. My classmates were calling him my secret admirer because they claimed he was always looking at me. I never noticed though, my head was usually buried in my book. You could ask Sophia for her notes, she's always writing. My head jerked up at the sound of my name. What? I asked, completely lost. The math teacher, Mr. Matt, smiled at me before pushing up his glasses. I was just telling Jeremy here to copy your note since his is blank. I swallowed. I had no notes and I knew he was aware of that, especially if the weird smile he gave me was enough inclination. I nodded and gave what I hoped was a confident smile. Mr. Matt continued his teaching and I exhaled in relief. After class ended, I was quick to get up. Sophia, wait behind please. My classmates muttered that I was in trouble and I agreed with them. When we were alone, he walked towards me and shoved his hands in his pockets. He told me he had been observing me for a while and noticed that I was into him. My jaw dropped open. He said he walked past my desk when I was coming up with outfit ideas for him. I was still speechless, so I couldn't say anything to defend myself. He told me that he understood my high school crush, but he wouldn't tolerate that. My cheeks were flaming hot from embarrassment, and I managed to tell him it wasn't like that. He merely smiled and put his hand on my shoulder before telling me to leave. I skipped his next class because I was too embarrassed to face him after what he told me. When I got to class the next day, he smiled at me. I ignored him, determined not to let him get to me. The day passed as usual and I was packing my things to go home when a junior student came up to me and told me that Mr. Matt wanted to see me. I reluctantly went to his class and found him on his knees behind his desk. When he discovered I was standing there, he waved me over and asked for my help. He said his wallet fell down and he couldn't find it. I knelt down beside him and joined him in the search. There was no wallet under the desk and I told him as much. He placed his hand on my thigh and I froze. When he noticed my reaction, he removed his hand and apologized. He told me I could go and that he would find his wallet himself. As I turned to leave, I noticed that his hand pushed something into his pocket. I acted like I didn't see it, but I could have sworn that it was his wallet. When I got home, there was a note on my bed. Matt was all it said. I opened my wardrobe and found another note. It said the same thing as the last one. I was getting freaked out. How did these notes get into my room? Was Mr. Matt behind this? I decided to keep my distance from him no matter what. He was turning out to be a weirdo. The next morning brought another shock. I stared at my reflection with my mouth open. My hair. Someone had cut it. I kept asking myself how it happened, but no answers were forthcoming. I went to school with my stomach in knots. Math was my first class, but I was so out of it that I didn't know when the class was over. Sophia? I glanced up to see that the class was empty and Mr. Matt was grinning at me. Is something wrong? 
he asked and raised his hand up. There was hair in his hand. Brown hair. My hair. It took a while for my brain to process what was in front of me. Why? I whispered. He walked towards me and I jumped out of my seat. Leave me alone! I yelled as I ran down the hallway, students staring at me in surprise. Mr. Matt was a monster. I wondered how I didn't see it before. I ran straight to the principal's office and told him what happened. I was in tears as I narrated everything Mr. Matt had done. When I finished, the principal shook her head sadly and told me that help was on the way. I thanked her and waited in her office like she instructed me to. Her door opened and two men in white coats came inside. It's like he told us. Hallucinations, panic, hysteria. I'm so sorry for her. Please do your best. The principal left the office, leaving me with the men. I didn't know what was happening, but it didn't look good for me. When they approached me, I was so scared that I screamed. They rushed at me and pinned me down. They injected me with something and I suddenly felt woozy. I was hearing fragments of people's conversations. Dumped her hair on my desk for no reason and yelled that I was the one who cut it. Single mom. The men took me to a psychiatric hospital where a number of tests were carried out on me. After three months of observing me, they finally released me, saying that I was now mentally stable. The first thing I did when I got out was to find out where Mr. Matt lived. I had no idea why he did this to me, and I was going to find out one way or another. Although this story is far from over, the majority of what I'll share occurred about 12 years ago. It's around 2009 and I'm still living with my folks. We've moved into the neighborhood when I was 13. Not long after I discovered the woods across the road, I was sort of forced into making the woods my sanctuary because of the bullying I experienced and all the turmoil at home. This neighborhood didn't have many kids living in it and the few there were were older among other things. All the hostility made me a very nervous kid. Any free time I had was spent alone. I got curious one day and wandered into the woods. There didn't appear to be anyone but me out there, and this gave me a strange feeling of safety, something I'd not felt for a long time. I found this small circle of cedar trees that made a secret open area and made it my clubhouse of sorts. As time passed, I began spending more and more time in the trees. I even accidentally fell asleep and spent the night out there once, and I was sure my parents were going to freak out, but they hadn't even noticed. This was the only excuse I needed. I began camping in my clubhouse every once in a while at first. I wasn't missed a single time. I knew I was going to need some camping supplies now, though. I tried bringing things from home, but they wore out fast. Asking my parents for money was out of the question. I began going door to door and offering my services as a lawnmower. I'd never mowed a lawn in my life, but that wasn't important. The real problem was finding a lawnmower. I would sneak my dad's mower out and do a job, but eventually I was caught and actually caught a beating for it. Fortunately, I had enough money by then to buy a really terrible end one of my own. It took all the money I'd saved, but it was a much safer way to make it. Once I managed to remake the money I'd lost, I hopped on my barely working bike and rode it to the five miles to this dinky army surplus place. I emerged with an Alice pack stuffed with various things that I thought I needed. I was so excited to try this stuff out. I skipped a whole week of school and camped out in my clubhouse. It was an addictive hobby, but something much more for me. It was the only source of safety and happiness I had. For the next however many years, I went to school just enough not to cause any trouble. I would go straight from school to my clubhouse every afternoon. By now, I'd come to see those woods as mine. Anybody in between would have been seen as an invader in my mind and... When that day came, I didn't think twice about striking back. It was a Sunday afternoon. I'd been camping out all weekend and was taking the well-worn path to the creek to get water. Across the creek, about 50 yards, was an almost deserted road. 
I rarely saw anyone use it. I caught sight of a parked camper. The two men walking in and out of it never seemed to notice me, and when I returned a few hours later they were still there. Only now they were drinking beers and mindlessly shooting guns. This made me furious, but when a stray bullet actually struck the water just feet from me, I had had enough. I ran the mile back home and called the sheriff. I assumed my call was anonymous, but now I'm not so sure. I made up a story that I had gotten lost and drove up on the men. I lied and said they had threatened me with their guns. And I realize how wrong that is now, but I was young and angry. One morning as I prepared for school, I overheard a news report about a big meth lab bust. Acting on an anonymous tip, sheriff's deputies found two men shooting guns on a country road. Upon further investigation, the camper the men were driving turned out to be a mobile meth lab. The two men were taken into custody and were being held pending bail hearings, and I knew this had to have been the call I made. The seriousness of the situation scared me, but I was confident no one would knew that it was me that had made the call, and for the next year I even followed the case. About three months before their sentencing hearing, I received an unnamed letter in the mail, and it simply said, you mess with the wrong people, kid. A jolt of ice-cold fear shot through me, but I still doubted it was from the two men. Any doubt I had was removed when another came the next week, this one far clearer. You better pray we get time served. I was too terrified at the time to wonder how they knew that it was me. I'm still not sure how they identified me, but the how no longer mattered. The letters continued to arrive. When the day of the hearing came, the news was not good. Both men were felons found with multiple firearms. Adding on the manufacturing charge and you get a minimum of 10 years. The judge was not feeling generous. He gave both of the men 20 years. I was sure my days on earth were numbered. I stopped going to school and spent all my time in the woods. I wasn't foolish enough to think that it would keep me safe, but if I was going to die, I wanted to die somewhere I loved. A strange thing happened though. The death I was expecting never came. Month after month I became more confident that it all had been a joke or more than likely just an intimidation tactic. My life flew by and this last ten years has been a series of ups and downs. The meth heads have been the last thing on my mind. Then last week a new anonymous letter showed up at my apartment. You better write a will. The end is close at hand. I involuntarily dropped it like a hot potato. My girlfriend was with me and witnessed it. She picked up the letter and read it, and I could tell she was concerned but I played it off as a prank and refused to explain. And just like that, a ghost from my past reappeared into the present. You can probably guess what this unwanted news had done to me. I feel like I'm constantly looking over my shoulder everywhere I go. I'm terrified these monsters may go after my girlfriend and newborn child. Going to the cops was a brief consideration, but without any proof of who the sender is, I know there's not much they can do. My options seem to be limited. Without anyone else to talk to, I'm anonymously emailing this in to tell my story. I'm not sure why. It could be because of the anonymity of the internet. There's not much more I can say other than to tell you all to be careful of the choices you make as a child. Wish me luck and please pray for me and my family. I know that love is something we all look for throughout our lives, and I was lucky enough to find it. But unfortunately, it was taken away from me way too early. I met my wife in college. She was an art major, and I studied finance. I always wanted to be rich, and I thought that finance was the way to go. At a frat party, when me and my buddies were getting drunk out of our minds, the most beautiful girl came through the door. She had blonde hair, green eyes, and a figure that would put most models to shame. Sure enough, every guy there wanted to get with her, and as hard as they tried, nothing came out of it. I knew she was out of my league, and I was the only one who didn't approach her that night. I guess that made me stand out because as the party went on and I was sitting on the couch trying to sober up as I had an exam the next day, she sat right next to me. Nice shirt, she said, as she revealed the most enchanting smile I ever saw. 
I remember it as if it were yesterday. I had a Blink-182 shirt. It was my favorite band at the time. And it seemed that she was also a fan. Thanks, I said, while the room was spinning around me. We started talking, and seeing that I was kind of dizzy, she brought me a coffee. It was love at first sight. For me, at least. She later said that it was also for her, but I didn't buy it. Fast forward, and there we were on our wedding day. We both graduated college, and after I met her, I really got on track. I stopped drinking so much and found myself a great job right after college. It paid well, and I can say that the future looked bright. The party was amazing. I spared no expense and gave her the wedding of her dreams. But the best part was yet to come. After the wedding, I arranged a special trip for our honeymoon. I didn't want to take her to all of the typical places around the world because, well, she was so special. I met a guy at the office who liked visiting beautiful islands that not many people knew about, and he hooked me up with a trip. The island was in South Africa. It was a small patch of land in the middle of the ocean, and you could only get there by boat. As we arrived on the island, my beautiful Amanda was smitten by everything she saw, and I was smitten by her in return. The place looked so wild, so untouched. I just love it, she said as she hugged me. We had a house right in the middle of the island. Everything we would need was there. There were no animals around, nothing but trees and the water surrounded us. It was some sort of resort, but only one couple could be there at the time. It was pretty exclusive. As the boat that brought us was leaving, we stood there on the beach taking it all in. I can't believe we're going to have the entire place to ourselves. We can walk around naked. We can do whatever we want with no restrictions, Amanda said while kissing me passionately. I was thrilled with the naked part and couldn't wait to do it. That evening, I made a barbecue as the fridge was filled with the most expensive meats from Wagyu to Black Angus. It's delicious. God, it's amazing to eat under the stars. And the sky is so clear here. Amanda said while taking a bite of her food. This whole week will be amazing, I know it, I told her while putting my hand on her. But instead of amazing, I should have said horrifying. The next day we went swimming and cracked some coconuts as it was something she wanted to do for a long time. We had an amazing time. And the best part of that day was that we walked around naked without anyone interrupting us. However, that night, something happened. We were sleeping soundly when I heard the door open. I woke up and went to see what was going on. It was indeed open. But what could it have been? We were alone there, so I blamed it on the wind. As I was closing it, I heard a voice coming from behind the trees. I slowly went over there after I grabbed the biggest knife I had. I cut through the thick vegetation and saw a small fire on the ground. And next to it, a woman sitting there with her back toward me. Hello? I asked. She didn't respond. I started walking toward her. As I did, she started speaking, but it was a language I couldn't understand. It seemed like she was speaking and singing at the same time. Shortly after, she started flailing her arms out, and I noticed that she was holding a bunch of dried up leaves that were smoldering. I went in front of her. The woman had a strange face, and her eyes were closed. She kept moving her arms and saying those enchantments. Everything got cold all of a sudden. I only had a pair of shorts and a t-shirt on. It felt like the temperature dropped under 40 degrees. Excuse me, I said while putting my hand on her shoulder. At that moment, she opened her eyes. I fell on my back. The woman got up. Her eyes were as white as snow without any pupils. You lost her! The woman yelled in English, and a cloud of red smoke surrounded her. I had a hard time breathing. My chest was hurting from all of that smoke. I started coughing and gasping for air. I rolled around the ground, trying so hard to get away from what was suffocating me. Finally, I managed to get some oxygen into my lungs. I got up, but I still felt woozy. I looked around. The woman wasn't there anymore. And the small fire that she had in front of her was gone too no trace of it. I went back to Amanda. Did I hallucinate? What the hell do they put in this water? I said, trying to make myself feel better. I went inside the house and walked straight to the bedroom. Amanda? I called her, 
upon seeing that she wasn't in the bed. I yelled again and again, but she didn't respond. I went outside to look for her. As the sun came up, I noticed something in the water. A head of blonde hair glistened in the sunlight. Amanda, what are you doing? I yelled as she was going further and further into the ocean. I jumped in the water, swimming toward her, but it was like the current was taking me back to shore. No matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't reach her. All I could do was look at my wife as she disappeared into the infinite ocean. Years later, I stumbled across a legend from those parts. I don't remember the name of the demon, but it said that on the 13th of every month, it takes the shape of an old man or old woman, and it goes hunting for a soul to take to hell. It said it possesses the person, and he or she commits suicide. I still have a Polaroid of me and Amanda. It's dated the 12th of June. She disappeared in the ocean the day after. We all had that one teacher who was our favorite. I don't know about you, but Mr. Campbell will always remain dear to my heart. I'll forever remember him as he was. On a Monday afternoon, Mr. Campbell, our history teacher, opened the door to our classroom. As he started to write, I noticed something on his wrist that reflected the sunlight right into my eyes. Mr. Campbell had a gold bracelet, and it seemed to have some writing on it. After class, he told me to stay for 10 more minutes. He wanted to give me some advice about which college to go to. So, Darren, I know you're keen on... Before he could finish his sentence, I interrupted him because the curiosity was killing me. I'm sorry, sir. I don't mean to be rude, but what's the story behind that bracelet? I never saw you wear anything like that before, and to be honest, it looks really old and interesting. I said, while my eyes couldn't look any other way. The teacher smiled. I could tell that he had an amazing story behind that piece of jewelry he had on his wrist. I had a feeling that it's something vintage that you won't be able to find in any store. Mr. Campbell then started to tell me where he got it. He always had a gift for storytelling, and of course, he didn't disappoint. He told me that he was walking on the way to the park one day. That's what he usually did after work. He took a stroll through the trees. I think he mentioned one time that it helped him clear his head. So as he was walking, he saw an old man sitting on a bench, and right there next to him, he laid out a white handkerchief with different items on it. Of course, Mr. Campbell stopped to take a look, and to his surprise, as an avid lover of anything with a history behind it, a couple of old coins grabbed his attention. They were from the 1300s, or at least that's what the old man told him. The teacher took a closer look, but upon inspection, they didn't seem in the best shape, even if they were so old. Then he looked at a journal. It was from World War I, and it contained the signature of one of the American soldiers. He had been keen on buying that and maybe tracking down the soldier's family, but something told him that there was more to the old man that met the eye. Is that all you have, kind sir? He asked the seller. At that moment, he smiled at the teacher, revealing a set of almost black teeth. He reached into his pocket and pulled out the bracelet. Campbell was fascinated by the inscriptions and the story they had behind them. As he was telling me the story, another teacher came into the classroom. There's a 4 p.m. meeting in the teacher's lounge. Campbell nodded and smiled. He was as excited to tell his story as I was to hear it. So, what's up with it? Is it old or something? I asked him. The teacher said that he found out from the old man that the inscriptions had been hand carved by an old English lord. He loved his fiance so much that he decided to do it all by hand. As I looked closer, I could see it said, Nothing above, you are the heavens, AP. It seemed that he was so in love with her that he gave all of his riches to her. Houses, horses, gold, everything. He even renounced his title. Only to find out that one day, she packed all his bags and kicked him out of the house. And just a few hours after that, another man moved in. 
The former lord was heartbroken. It said that he spent the rest of his days in bad company. He even lived with a family that was famous for practicing witchcraft. And a week before he committed suicide, as a final wish, he wanted the family to put a curse on his ex fiancee and on everything she owned. After that, her houses either burned down or collapsed due to rotten wood. They either got flooded or broken into by robbers. And she got a stomach disease that made her lose weight and ultimately die a painful death. Wow, that's amazing! Did you manage to find out who that guy was? By his initials? I asked him. But before he could answer, the principal came into the classroom and asked for his help with something. The next time I saw him was two days after that. I saw him in the hallway and I waved at him. He didn't respond. Instead, he looked ahead without even noticing me. He looked pale and it seemed that he had lost some weight. In just two days nonetheless. Then I bumped into him again the day after that. He looked even worse. His eyes appeared to not be focused, and his complexion made him look sick. Mr. Campbell, are you okay? I stopped in front of him and asked. He looked at me, but in a sense, he didn't. He looked right through me. He nodded and continued to walk past me. I was worried about him and asked some of my other classmates if they knew what's going on, but they didn't have a clue. I didn't see him for a week after that. Me and two friends went to the principal to see if Mr. Campbell was alright. He told us that he had some sort of stomach flu. We went over to his house after class. I knocked on the door and it seemed to open all by itself. Mr. Campbell, it's me, Darren. I'm with Alex. We wanted to see if you're okay. No one answered. Mr. Campbell, hello? I said again while we walked inside. A dreadful stench invaded our nostrils. It smelled like rotting flesh in there, and there were dirty dishes all over the floor. The paint on the walls was scratched off, and I even saw some blood on the sofa. Alex thought it was too weird, and he decided to leave, but I was keen on finding out what's going on with Campbell. Seeing that the living room and kitchen were empty, I walked upstairs. With each step I took, a weeping sound caught my attention. It got louder and louder the closer I got to the bedroom. I knocked on the door. It was halfway open. Mr. Campbell? I said while opening it all the way. There he was, on the bed, with his back facing the door. I walked toward him. I put a hand on his shoulder. Mr. Campbell, it's me, Darren, I said. He turned around. He had hollowed cheeks and his eyes were sinking in their sockets. The man lost a lot of weight and he looked like a shell of his former self. Help me, he whispered right before he fell head first on the floor. I panicked but quickly tried to lift him up. He was so light. I put him on the bed but his eyes didn't open. I started dialing 911 but at that moment he spoke. But it wasn't his voice. It sounded like a demonic woman's voice. I despise you, Alistair. I pray that you rot in hell. Alistair? AP? I said to myself before a deafening scream filled the room. Ah! Campbell's body started convulsing. His chest was rising off the bed as if he was levitating. The bedroom door shut all by itself. I tried to open it to run away, but it was locked. It looked like the body of my teacher was twisting and turning in the air, while at the same time the deafening scream refused to stop. In fact, it got louder and louder. I felt like I couldn't take it anymore. I pushed my hands so hard on my ears that my head started to hurt. It all sounded like I was in hell. It was unbearable. But out of nowhere, his body fell on the floor. The screaming stopped. I got up from my crouched position and checked on my teacher. His heart stopped. As I was calling the ambulance, I accidentally touched the bracelet. Immediately, it burned my skin. And as I removed my hand and took a closer look at the injury, I saw that it left a mark. The paramedics came and declared Mr. Campbell dead. They asked me what happened, but I couldn't tell them anything. 
I said that I found him like this. No one would believe me anyway. Before they came, I removed the bracelet with a piece of the bed sheet. That evening, I went to the lake and threw it in the water as the moon was shining in the sky. As I returned home through the park, someone was sitting on the bench. It was dark and late. Usually, the park's empty at that hour. Anyway, I passed by the man and kept walking. It'll come back, you know. I heard. I quickly turned around, but he wasn't there anymore. So this all happened to my best friend back when she was like 15, way back in the mid-2000s. We live in rural Alabama, like right out in the middle of the sticks, and one Friday night, her dad gets a hankering for a basket of royal reds. They want to head out, but they also couldn't get a sitter at such a short notice. This suited my BFF, who was saying how she didn't need a babysitter, that she was basically a grown-up and could be trusted to be left home alone for the night. Her parents agree, but tell her she better be in bed and asleep by the time they get home, which would be sometime after 11pm. If she wasn't, she'd be grounded, but if she was, her mom told her that she'd take her shopping the next day. Pretty sweet deal, right? Home alone and a shopping spree. I'm swooning just thinking about it. Anyway, it comes the night of her parents' little dinner date, they give her some money for pizza, and she basically has the time of her life watching whatever she wanted on the TV, pigging out on pizza and ice cream. She had the entire place to herself. All she had to do was be in bed by like 11.15, and she'd have herself half a whole new wardrobe. So the time comes, and she has the whole kitchen clean and tidy. Ice cream away, pizza boxes chucked in the trash, and she's all up in her PJs, mission accomplished. Then out of nowhere, she hears the front door to her home open and close, and footsteps down in the hallway. So she jumps into bed, turns off the lights, then lies in bed with her back to the bedroom door and pretends to be asleep. Sure enough, she hears her parents climbing the stairs quietly, shushing each other and giggling as they went. Obviously, they've been a little too liberal with their drinks, and in hindsight, maybe that's why they wanted her to be in bed by the time they came home, so she wouldn't be able to poke fun at them for being drunk. Anyway... She's still lying there, not making a sound, when she hears the handle of her bedroom door begin to turn. They're obviously checking to see if she's actually asleep, so she lies real still and doesn't make a sound. Then whoever it was who opened the door, either her mom or dad, they start creeping across the carpet towards her. Then when they reach her bedside, they lean over, stroke her hair a little, and then give her a kiss on the side of the head. That confirmed that they had been drinking because... All she could smell was booze as whoever it was crept out of the room, and then there was silence again. Mom and Dad must have just gone right to bed to sleep off their margaritas because she barely heard a thing after that. Maybe some stumbling to and from the bathroom, but apart from that, silence. She's actually kind of sleepy by that point, so she just lays there, drifts off, then wakes up bright and early the next morning, ready for her shopping trip reward. She rolls over, checks her phone, only to discover she has a bunch of texts from her mom, all time for an hour or so after she'd fallen asleep. She opens them, half expecting a bunch of, you're an amazing daughter, I love you, XOXO, drunk texts, but in her half-asleep haze, what she reads makes no sense to her whatsoever. The message read something like, Honey, I'm sorry if we worried you, but we saw Aunt Barb and her new boyfriend and we totally lost track of time. We're staying in a motel tonight, but we'll be back tomorrow around 12. Promise. Then we can go to that shopping trip. I can only imagine what that must have been like at the time, but my friend said the information was a square peg and her brain was a round hole. It just wouldn't fit. Her parents had come all the way home, then gone back out again. But why? She texts her mom like, did you come home last night? And as she does... She said she felt her heart begin to pound in her chest. Because if she said no, she was either lying or it wasn't either of her parents in the house the night before. It was a complete stranger. As soon as that horrible penny really dropped for her, she called her mom in a panic, who obviously then told her to call the cops ASAP. 
but when they got there, there was nothing to tell them how the stranger had gotten in, if anything was taken, or how they gotten out. My friend swears that she'd heard the front door close quietly. But if that was the case, how did the guy get a copy of the front door key? Even scarier is their security cameras didn't record anyone walking up their driveway, and there's literally no other way to get to the front of the property without being caught on it. It 100% wasn't some kind of dream either, because someone had evidently, and very quietly, gone through her mom's clothes at some point during the night. No one was ever caught over it. The cops didn't even have a suspect, and I don't believe my friend would just make something up like that. Like she was really actually upset about it for a really long time, and unless the whole thing is an elaborate cover story for something else, then it really did happen. It just freaks me out thinking the guy is still out there, and that he's that good at being a freaking creep, that he can do all that stuff and stay totally undetected. Just the thought of it makes my skin crawl. I've actually had stalkers ruin two separate Thanksgivings, each about five years apart, and the first was at an alarmingly young age, too. I was 13 while he was 12, and we had math class together. Pretty much everyone knew he had this huge crush on me, which wouldn't have been a problem on its own, but, but this kid was also the biggest perv I've ever met in my life. I know that's quite a bold claim for a 12-year-old, but it was a huge problem at our school for a while. He used to try to look up girls' shorts or grab them in the hallway. He once got caught sneaking into the girls' locker room with one of those old-style flip phones with a camera, too, and I had no idea how he managed to get away with just a few weeks' suspension over it. Needless to say, it was no surprise that he began to harass me when he asked me out and I rejected him. He would wait for me at my locker every day and whisper creepy stuff to me as I walked past. Stuff I definitely wouldn't be able to type up word for word because it'd 100% get this taken down. He then started following me to class. Like, I have no idea how, but he worked out exactly what my timetable was, so he was able to basically just track me around school. I told my teachers, the school counselor, the vice principal, but nothing was done against this kid. The best they could do was switch my classes so he'd have trouble tracking me, and that worked for about a week. After that, he escalated and started following me out to the bus. After a while, he'd managed to figure out my schedule, my bus number, my student ID, and was in the process of finding my home address and phone number. Then right when I was at my breaking point, he asked me out again. Like, it wasn't just to get back at me for rejecting him. He honestly thought that harassing me would, like, bring me around to the idea of dating him. This went on from the beginning of the semester, and right around Thanksgiving time, I actually screamed no in his face. I was just so scared and tired and mad by that point. He actually looked kind of shocked for a second, but then the ugly little worm in him came out, and he told me he was actually going to come over to my house on Thanksgiving itself, and he was going to bring a gun to kill me and my whole family. I didn't believe him at first, but he did have a gun, but... I had already told my math teacher about it, and cops came over to his house a few days prior to check his thinking, as they put it. And thank God it was just an airsoft gun, and he was obviously just intending to scare me, but if he'd have shown up with that thing, I know for a fact that my dad would have just blasted him without checking if it was real or not. I thought the school would finally expel him after that, and thankfully, that was the final straw for the principal who had him transferred to a school for kids with behavioral problems shortly after. That was nearly almost 20 years ago now, and I live on the other side of the country, so I'm not too worried about him finding me. But it definitely stuck with me for a long while, and seriously colored my opinion in men in a distinctly negative way. My second stalker was a guy I dated in high school. Since we were headed to different colleges, I broke up with him just after graduation, and he basically just went nuts over it like actual clinical nervous breakdown type thing. I think that was just leftover stress from the SATs or how I sort of started to compartmentalize it at first. He got worse and worse as the months went by though and finally, when I traveled home for Thanksgiving, he tried breaking into my mom's house while we were both asleep upstairs. He stalked me almost everywhere I went and until I could put together some actual evidence of what he was doing, the cops couldn't do a freaking thing. 
When I got a new car, he called my work from the business next door and told me my new license plate. He was just relentless. One night, he called my house like every minute, on the minute, for almost an hour straight. My parents had to unplug all the phones to get some peace, and my dad called the cops from his cell phone. This all came to a head when he attacked me one day when I was walking downtown that same Thanksgiving weekend. I was with a friend at the time, and he must have gotten a visit from the cops and assumed it was me that called them. He hit me so hard that he almost fractured my orbital socket. And finally, he went to jail for a few months, and that gave me a way out. I moved an hour away, changed my number, got a new job, and blocked him on any social media I had. In addition to lockdown privacy settings, he's moved to a different town and is still wildly unstable. My life has gotten so much better, and I've had so many positive changes, and I hope he never hears about any of it. But there's definitely a little piece of my trauma that I'm not able to let go of. Stuff that just changed you and you're left constantly looking over your shoulder, carrying a taser, always ready to fight if that one nightmarish person turns up in your life again. Because I know that if he does find me again, he won't give me another chance to get away. He'll kill me. I know he will. So I always have to be ready. I took another picture with a hint of cleavage and posted it on my OnlyFans page. I smiled as reactions started coming in. In the real world, I was what most people would call a nerd. I had big, square-framed glasses and I wore baggy clothes. No one really paid attention to me. But on OnlyFans, I was a super hot, daring woman. No one knew about my secret life, and I wanted to keep it that way. I sighed as I reluctantly closed my laptop so I could get some reading done for my test. Okay, I groaned after about two hours. I had managed to get about two hours of reading done. I giggled and opened my OnlyFans page and read through the comments. They were mostly from guys and they heaped praises and compliments on me. I froze on a particular one that said I should show more skin. After that comment, other comments like that started to come in. I bit my lip. Considering it, there was no risk involved. I dressed up in my bikini and went on Google to search provocative styles. I posted a few of the pictures I took and watched in amazement as the engagement on my page doubled. I went to bed early so I could wake up in time for my test. The test was a success, and I was confident that I would get nothing less than an A on it. After the rest of my classes, I headed to my apartment and went to take a shower. I lived alone and quite enjoyed it. My parents paid my bills even though they lived a few states away. I was 21 and soon to graduate from college and I could hardly wait. I opened my backpack and removed my books. What's this? A piece of paper had fallen out of my bag. I picked it up and saw that there was something written on it. It read, I know you, sexy Lexi. Chills went through my body and blood drained from my face. Sexy Lexi was my username on OnlyFans. Someone had found out my secret. I paced thinking about the person who wrote the note. I didn't know what to do, so I just decided to sleep on it. My eyes snapped open suddenly. I glanced at the clock. It was 1.30 in the morning. I sat up in bed and rubbed my arms. There was a cold wind blowing outside. I frowned because I was sure that I closed the window before sleeping. I got up and went to close it, then saw something hanging from the handle. It was another note. Sexy Lexi. You're even sexy when you sleep. Meet me beside the physics lab by 6 p.m. tomorrow. My legs were shaking so bad that I had to sit down. I held the note in my hands and didn't get any sleep. I went to the place the note said and waited. I was starting to get scared. There was no one on this side of campus and it was pretty dark. Hi, Lexi. I turned towards the voice. It was Matt, a guy in my class. He smirked at the look at my face and walked closer to me. Who knew that you're beautiful under all those clothes? I swallowed and told him to leave me alone. When I said that, he laughed and pressed himself into my body, wrapping his hand around my waist. If you scream, everyone's gonna know your dirty little secret. I shook my head and begged him not to tell anyone. Matt was breathing hard as he buried his face into my neck. 
I held myself still as his hand went under my shirt and he groped my breasts. When he released me, I slapped his face and told him to never do that again. I didn't post anything again on OnlyFans, but I still read through the comments. They used to excite me before, but now they didn't. A new comment came in. Sexy Lexi attends my school, the comment read. I suddenly felt very faint. Was Matt threatening me? I messaged him privately and asked what his problem was. His reply was that he wanted me to be with him, and I had to be sexy Lexi, not boring Alexi. I stared at his reply, wondering how I was going to get out of this situation. I paced the length of my room, thinking. I came to a conclusion. I told Matt to do whatever he wanted, because I wouldn't put up with his threats anymore. He didn't send a reply, and I was glad that it had come to an end. It didn't matter if people knew about it. It wasn't like I had friends in school anyway. I went to sleep, happy with myself. The wind blowing through the window woke me up again. This time I didn't have a chance to glance at the clock. There was someone in my room. Before I could scream, he covered my mouth with his gloved hand. I couldn't make out his face in the dark, and I cursed myself for sleeping with the lights off. Not so brave now, are you? It was Matt, and this realization doubled my struggles. He straddled me on the bed and captured both my hands with his other hand. He raised my hands above my head, effectively pinning me down. He warned me that if I screamed, he would break a few of my bones. Then he removed his hand from my mouth. Please! I choked out, tears running down my face. My heart was hammering in my chest, and I didn't think I've ever been this scared in my life. He told me that the only way I could ever imagine to get out of this was for me to dress like I had in my pictures. I agreed to do it, and he released me. I wiped the tears from my face and took out the bikini I wore in the last picture. When I tried to go to the bathroom to change, he stopped me and told me to change in front of him. My hands were trembling as I removed my PJs and wore the bikini. I tried to focus on something other than his leering eyes on my body, but it was difficult to do. He stood up and put on the lights to see me better. Then he asked me to strike a pose. I was crying now and I kept begging him. He sighed and told me that he just wanted personal pictures of me and that after I complied he would leave me alone. So I wiped my face and did as he asked, even though I kept thinking he could easily kill me and no one would know who did it. The smile on my face was plastic and I felt like throwing up. Now that wasn't so bad, was it? He smiled at me then reached out to pet my hair. He told me that if he ever got bored, he would come back for me. When he left, I crumbled into a ball and cried for a long time. I knew that if he came again, I wouldn't be able to stop him. The only thing I could do was to report him, and I wasn't sure I had the courage to. I could only hope the situation wouldn't get worse. I grew up in a single parent household. Just me, my sister, and my mom with my grandpa occasionally lending a hand with parenting duties. And when I was about four or five years old, we were broken into, twice. I didn't know all the details of the whole thing until years later, like I have vague memories of moving apartments and some cops coming over to the house, but I was pretty much kept in the dark until I was old enough to handle what had gone down. For the first break-in, we were all out grocery shopping, so my mom didn't realize anything had happened until we got home. There was an open window, open drawers, the way my grandpa tells it. It's like my mom interrupted them in the middle of doing something and they climbed out of a second floor window as soon as he'd heard us arrive. That or whoever it was just didn't care about people knowing he'd been there. The second break-in happened three months later, only this time the guy broke in at nighttime while we were all asleep. I had to get all this from my grandpa because understandably my mom hates talking about it but the way he tells it, she basically woke up in the middle of the night and sensed a presence in the room with her. Not like a spirit or anything dumb like that. Like an actual person. Then when she opened her eyes, there was someone standing next to her bed with something shiny in his hand. She told Grandpa she was literally frozen with terror. Couldn't move. Couldn't talk. Literally petrified in the very sense of the word. 
Apparently the guy was mumbling something, but mom couldn't remember exactly what. Then by the time she started begging him not to hurt her, she couldn't hear anything at all. My sister remembers walking into her room, thinking that she was having a nightmare. She asked mom if she was okay. Mom threw the covers from over her head, saw the guy was gone, then noticed the second floor window was open where the guy had used the same escape route as the first break-in. She put my little sister back to bed. I obviously have no memory of this because I was asleep. She called 911, then she called my grandpa. Grandpa said the cops found faint, muddy footprints all over the house, including in our bedrooms, so he'd obviously taken his time exploring the place before he'd woken my mom up. Only, this guy hadn't just been exploring. He'd been very, very busy, and it actually took us a few days to uncover all the bizarre little things he'd done, things which spoke to just how insane this person really was. The next day, when we noticed that the cat wouldn't touch her milk, Mom poured it out into the sink, thinking that it had gone sour, then got the distinct smell of bleach as she did so. She can't be certain, but she thinks the guy poured bleach into the cat's milk, wanting to kill it. Then, there was the cracked, empty eggs in the fridge. Not like cracked all the way, just little holes in the top with all the yolk and egg white missing. It's possible he just poured them down the sink, but Grandpa thinks the guy might have been sucking them raw. Not all that scary, I know, just freaky, you know? Mom says some meat was missing from the fridge too, raw meat, but I know Grandpa used to feed our cat from the fridge too, so we can't rule that out. A few days later, Grandpa came over in the evening for some dinner and offered to help prep for garbage day. He says one of the garbage cans spilled right as he got into the driveway, complains to my mom about tin cans in the garbage or whatever, and then goes on to clean up and finds what spilt it. Someone, presumably the guy who broke in, had thrown a pair of scissors in the trash, along with a clothing catalog he'd been cutting up. He cut the heads off almost every single motto in that catalog, and the little paper heads were nowhere to be found. My grandpa thinks the guy took them as some kind of trophy, but who knows what he really did with them. Then there was the salt in my mom's work shoes the knife missing from her knife block in the kitchen, obviously the shiny thing he'd been holding when she woke up to him in her room. Anyways, the cops got plenty of fingerprints, but whoever it was didn't have a record, and other than the muddy boot prints they found, there was nothing much to go on. So to this day, no one's been arrested for it, but my grandpa thinks he knows who it was. Years later, after we'd moved apartments twice in a bid to avoid the guy, a friend of a distant relative ended up getting locked up in some kind of psychiatric hospital. The guy had become obsessed with Alice in Wonderland, had all the books, multiple copies of them too, and all he ever talked about was the looking glass or Wonderland and all this stuff. It might just be a complete coincidence, but the thing is, that's my mom's name, Alice. She's over the whole thing now. It's been more than 20 years since all of that, but I know that if she doesn't like talking about it, even today, it had to have messed her up for a while.